starts right now. Confusion and chaos at Jefferson High School today, leaving many parents and students terrified. Why some say the miscommunication is a direct impact from the mass shooting in Uvalde. Migrants who are in San Antonio now suing after they say they were misled into getting onto flights headed east. What the mayor says about the city under the spotlight. And getting the health care you need becoming more accessible for rural areas. The partnership that is making that happen is coming up. But we begin tonight with the calm after an emotional afternoon outside of Jefferson High School. That school went on lockdown after a student called San Antonio police to report a fight and a possible weapon on campus. Parents outside anxiously waiting to reunite with their children. The night team's Lee Waldman breaks down what we know about what unfolded there today. Confusion. It was just crazy. Like, I don't know what happened. I'm confused. Everybody's out here. Everybody's scared. Fear. I couldn't get a hold of him. And if it was an active shooter, what if he was one that got shot? And I wouldn't have known. And mayhem outside of Jefferson High School today after false reports of a shooting. No evidence whatsoever that any there was actually yeah, shooting. Was ever a shooting. Ever. According to SAPD, a call came in around 1 p.m. for a shooting in progress. Officers cleared the campus and found no evidence of an active threat or shooting at the school. They worked to clear every classroom and hallway. During that time, parents outside became distressed while they waited for their children to be released. That was the outcome that you saw out here, is parents being impatient, not going through the entire process that we have in place for that reunification. SAISD Police Chief Johnny Reyes and Superintendent Jaime Aquino said the district followed their policies and procedures exactly when it came to locking down the school. All students and staff were completely safe. I know we're living in very difficult time, but you need to trust us that we have all the protocols in place to ensure the safety of all children and all staff. Aquino says there does need to be more training done outside of the school so parents and families know what's expected of them. We have need to have tighter communication with parents before this happening. Today, parents got a phone call and an email from the school about what was happening inside. An alert was also put out on the district's website. In the future, the district says they'll send out a text message as well. At Jefferson High School, Lee Waldman, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Lee. Now, KSAT 12 typically does not report on school threats unless it is deemed credible or an arrest is made. The law enforcement response and the rush from parents had us investigate exactly what was going on at Jefferson. Again, there was no shooting, no weapon found on the campus of Jefferson High School today. Even still, emotions obviously very high outside of Jefferson as parents waited for information and for their students to be released. One man even punched out a window during all of that. He was not charged given the emotion of that situation. Yeah, and the tragedy in Uvalde likely not far from parents' minds today. The 19th John Paul Baraja spoke to a former detective and a psychiatrist who say today's scene was a clear impact of the shooting in Uvalde. You know, what you see there is anxiety, fear, frustration, but it's piled on top of a lot of anger. I mean, you can hear the anger. The anger comes from the distrust. Much of that distrust stems from the failures of law enforcement just four months ago in Uvalde. Psychiatrist Dr. Harry Croft says the trauma of Rob Elementary can create fear of a similar tragedy that likely led to parents rushing officers at Jefferson High School and almost two weeks ago families swarming New Braunfels High School for what turned out to be non-credible threats at both schools. <laughs> Former detective Michael Helley says this is likely the new normal for school threat responses. They need to figure out who the bad guys are and who the good guys are, right, when the first responders that are coming in. And the worst thing to have happen is, is a parent that is a licensed carry. They don't know who this person is. All they know is that they've got a, somebody with a gun. And all of a sudden, boom, here we see somebody with a gun. Both Helly and Dr. Croft say communication is key for those in charge. Getting out accurate information as soon as possible can ease tensions and keep emotions from boiling over. But Croft adds officials will need to rebuild trust with parents. And the more we discuss this and bring it out in the open, including our own frustration, our own anger, and, and little by little, 
will learn more and more ways to cope. Until that's reached, Helly says officials need to find a way to handle potential threats and parents who still lack faith in law enforcement. If we don't have a good plan in place, then something bad is really going to happen. And I God bless everybody that's still there, that's still doing the job, because it is immensely a lot more difficult than when I was there. Former Detective Helly says he completely understands why the parents reacted the way they did, but that doing so can make those situations so much more dangerous for everyone involved. John Paul Barajas, KSAT 12 News. Trust does need to be rebuilt. Thank you, John Paul. Meanwhile, Venezuelan migrants who boarded a plane thinking they were going to Boston, but instead taken to Martha's Vineyard, now suing Florida's Governor Ron DeSantis. Florida's Secretary of Transportation, also named in the lawsuit. It was filed in a Boston federal court, alleging the migrants were told they were going to Boston or Washington, D.C., and bribed with perks like $10 McDonald's gift certificates. Instead, they wound up at Martha's Vineyard. The class action lawsuit is being filed on behalf of the migrants who were aboard last year's flights. Governor DeSantis' office did not respond to a request for a comment. As part of our case at Q&A, we spoke with San Antonio Mayor Ron Nuremberg about the recent events involving migrants getting bussed and flown out of state. He says what's been happening is inhumane. Sending folks in here to lure people away, to promise them to go someplace and have whatever it is, a job or, or a uh, place to stay lined up under false pretenses, that's when things get disrupted. And unfortunately, you have to wonder if some of these things are being done to score political points, but also being done purposefully to, to, to disrupt an already difficult situation. And by the way, I misspoke earlier. The flights took place last week. The mayor goes on to say in the meantime, the city will continue to work with nonprofits and faith based groups to help those who come here to seek asylum. One suspect now arrested in connection with a fatal shooting where one man was found dead inside an apartment. 18 year old Daryl Love, the second facing a murder charge for the death of 33 year old Carlos Madrazo. That shooting happened on September 8th at the apartment complex on Westward Drive near Lackland. According to an arrest affidavit, Love and three others went into that apartment looking for someone. That's when Madrazo got upset with them. The arrest affidavit states that Love allegedly hit the victim with a gun before firing at least three shots. The fourth suspect ran off shortly after Madrazo was taken to University Hospital, where he was pronounced dead. In continuing our coverage of a fatal shooting where San Antonio police shot and killed a man who had outstanding warrants, SAPD has now released the name of the suspect and officers involved. At least one of the officers. The suspect is 28 year old Alejandro Vitella. Two SAPD officers made contact with him on West Martin near South Zarzamora Street. Police say when they approached him, Vitella started fighting one of the officers. When he broke away, police say he allegedly said he had a gun and was going to shoot them. SAPD says he actually reached, reached towards his waistband, which is when Officer Jacob Garcia fired several shots toward the suspect leading to his death. Garcia, a 13 year veteran, is now on administrative duty. Now for a look at headlines in your night beat news flash. The hope is that millions of people registered to vote today on National Voter Registration Day. We stopped by UIW to see the efforts happening there. Move Texas, a registration nonprofit, hosted an event there to get more people signed up. UIW, just one of three college campuses where the organization was set up today. The registration process is fairly straightforward. The last day to register to vote is October 11th. Then on Monday, October 24th, early voting begins and Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th. It's beginning to look a lot like Fiesta in the form of a poster anyway. Five posters designed by five different local artists all unveiled today. Now the Fiesta Commission members will vote on which one will be the official poster for Fiesta 2023. Each design shows a different idea and perspective of what Fiesta is and what it means. The official poster will be revealed on February 1st. The management company of a Leon Valley apartment complex court ordered to make a list of repairs to its quote deplorable conditions 
is now asking a judge to rescind that ruling. Attorneys representing Vista Del Rey Apartments filed a motion to dissolve the court orders. The city of Leon Valley filed the lawsuit against the apartment management company after they say numerous attempts to get them to comply with health and safety city ordinances failed. The city says the complex many times has not had hot water for tenants, and there have been numerous photos of exposed wiring and other code violations. Attorneys for the apartment argue the court went beyond its legal reach. City attorneys have filed a response and are awaiting a court hearing. And that's a look at your Nightbeat News Flash. The devastation in Puerto Rico feels never ending. See the areas once repaired from a previous storm washed away as the death toll rises. Saving time and saving lives, the partnership that aims to make medical care more accessible in rural communities and where that mobile clinic is now headed next on the Night Beat. There is no doubt the pandemic forced people to pivot. For some, that meant working from home. Yeah, for others, it brought an opportunity to have medical access closer to home. A new model of care is bringing nurses into rural areas, but as the night team's Patty Santos learned, there are still some big challenges. The mobile health clinic parked outside Natalia ISD saved Anissa Ramirez time Super. and energy on a day when she was not feeling well. It's very convenient that I didn't have to go out of my way to go get checked out or anything. How far do you usually have to drive? Um, San Antonio, an hour. The chance to get checked out closer to home is thanks to a new partnership. South Texas Rural Health Services, the University of the Incarnate Word, and the University of Texas teamed up to bring COVID testing and vaccines into rural areas, only to stay for other medical needs. But not everyone knows the service is available. I, I think we are still lacking uh, the community awareness. Mobile clinics can be found outside schools in Italia, Carrizo Springs, Catula, and Dilly throughout the month, as well as the Frio and LaSalle County jails. We know that rural communities are, are the areas of the population that are less. They don't tend to go to the doctors because of the distance. And just what kind of service can you get? Well, it tells you right here, anything from medical to dental to mental health. We are truly a medical hub of one-stop shop, as you will where people can come and get an array of services. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. To find out when the mobile clinic is in your community, go to our website at KSAT.com. It is arguably the race in Bear County this election, the race to replace Nelson Wolf as Bear County judge. Republican Trish DeBerry and Democrat Judge Peter Sakai hoping voters will give them the nod this November. USAA held a town hall this afternoon with the candidates, a forum for USAA employees to hear the differences between the two candidates. I was honored to be the moderator for this year's event. As for why they should earn your vote, DeBerry touted her experience as a business owner. Sakai talked about his experience as a district court judge. Hurricane Fiona now barreling up through the Atlantic Ocean, growing stronger after slamming Puerto Rico and then the Dominican Republic. At least four people have died so far as a result of that storm. In Puerto Rico, teams assessing the damage there. The governor saying that that process could take about a week. Fierce winds, torrential downpours prompting more than a thousand rescues. A bridge which was rebuilt after it was destroyed by Hurricane Maria washed away once again. The power company there says a large part of Puerto Rico will have power back between today and tomorrow, but because of the rain from Fiona, the delayed the response time rather is delayed. Meantime here, we just, you know, bearing through <laughs> An extended summer, apparently, know, as we look at the Tower Life building downtown. Some relief, please. Yeah. How long is summer going to stick around, <laughs> Adam? For I don't care what the calendar says. Yeah, for the rest of this week. You know, we actually made up a lot of rainfall in August, and now what a typical August weather pattern would be is settling in. Our average afternoon high in August is 97, and we're going to be even a little above that in the days ahead. The heat high, the big blue H, it's back, and it's going to sit overhead for several more days. That's going to mean some record challenging high temperatures in the days ahead. I also want to point out some new tropical development that's very likely within a few days and could make its way into the Gulf of Mexico. 
Let's get to all of it, starting with the temperature outlook 97 tomorrow. That's after a high temperature of 96 today. Tomorrow 97, 99 by Thursday, Friday 99 degrees, and that would tie the record for the day. And then we moderate a little bit into the weekend, mid 90s, and then early next week, closer to 91. So there you have it. 96 are high today in San Antonio. That's four degrees shy of the record. But look at Little Rock, Arkansas, 100. Memphis, Wichita, even Omaha, all 100 degrees for their high temperatures. Yes, summer like weather pattern, record breaking heat as you head northern farther north up the plains. Big old upper level high, the big blue H it's overhead and it's here to stay for several more days. As usual, it's deflecting the active weather and the rain around us that goes around the periphery of the upper level high that clockwise circulation around it on the far outer edge of the clock. That's where you get the moisture and the disturbances and then precipitation. But around here, we're too close to the center of this high and it's going to keep all the action away from us. Here's our future cast and notice how this high just drifts overhead, lingering for the rest of this week. And by the weekend, it starts to break down. And this is going to open the door for a weak cold front that's going to hit us early on Monday. Don't expect any huge changes from this cold front. It's not going to force you to grab your hoodie and have that fall like football weather out there. But I do think this cold front will put a little dent in our temperatures and I think more importantly, help steer a potential tropical cyclone away from the Texas coastline. So let's talk about it. Fiona, that's headed north between Bermuda and the east coast of the U.S., Gaston, that's a fish storm way out in the North Atlantic. We're watching this area of disturbed weather just north of South America, 90% likelihood. I mean, it's almost a slam dunk with this that it's going to turn into our next tropical depression, then tropical storm in the coming days, move into the Caribbean, and thereafter, it could actually make its way into the Gulf of Mexico as we get into next week. But with that pattern shift associated with that cold front, should that head into the Gulf of Mexico and then probably even strengthen more, it would then most likely get pushed eastward. Of course, a lot hinges on that. That's just the way it looks right now, but we'll keep you updated as things will be changing. We'll be fine tuning the forecast. All right, temperatures 84 in town, 85 in Hondo, Bulverde 82 degrees. You notice the humidity out there, dew points near 70. That's not going to be the case tomorrow afternoon. Now, early in the morning, yes, but by the afternoon, dew points down near 60 and even in the upper 50s. So despite the heat, sunny, 97, the high temperature, we're not going to have the big humidity for the afternoon. No rain chances, unfortunately. And by the way, fall equinox, Thursday, 8.04 p.m., 99 degrees for it. Glad you mentioned it because the temperatures don't exactly, you know. Say fall. No, they don't. <laughs> <laughs> or more of a heat quinox. There you go. Thank you. All right, so the Cowboys about to get some good news. Well, Hopefully. you know, it's bad news for a former San Antonio high school football player. Could be good news for one of two people. When we come back, it's the move the Cowboys made today that has us wondering is Michael Gallup on his way back this Monday night. And we continue our Case at Pigskin Classic Tour with a stop in Judson coming up. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. Former Warren High School football player Dennis Houston has been weighed by the Dallas Cowboys after turning some heads in training camp. Houston made the 53-man roster and was active in the first two games of this season, but the signals one of two things. They may be ready to activate Michael Gallup, who's been recovering from offseason ACL surgery, or they're going to activate wide receiver Jalen Tolbert, who they invested a third-round draft pick in this offseason. Cowboys owner Jerry Jones was asked point blank today if Gallup is ready to come back. I like where Michael is physically, and I don't know if we're going to try to uh, go with him on Sunday or not. I mean, Monday, I don't know, uh, but uh, we'll see how this week goes. But uh, he's uh, he's really doing some good things out there, and uh, we have missed him, and it'll be good to get him back out there. Cowboys kick off on Monday Night Football against the Giants, set for 7.15 p.m. live on KSAT 12. 
UTSA Roadrunners are host Texas Southern in the Alamo Dome this Saturday afternoon after arguably the most difficult first three games of the season in college football against Houston Army and most recently Texas where they managed to come out one and two with one of those losses in triple overtime to the Cougars. And while the Roadrunners can be very proud of the way they played in those games, including the overtime win on the road against Army, it has also been costly. UTSA is nursing as many as 21 players on the injury report. Today, head coach Jeff Trailer revealed two of them had season-ending surgeries with major adjustments that need to be made. Trailer was into work very early this morning. In about 3.05, I got in here to work this morning, and, you know, we talked about what is pound the fist. And, and pound the fist in life, there's always these three Ds, right? There's doubt, there's disappointment, and there's defeat. And uh, pound the fist really is a, a, a mindset of we have an objective we want to achieve and earn, but I can't guarantee them that's gonna happen. But what I can guarantee them is if that we don't represent the brand, we will have no shot at getting to the ultimate objective. And we'll see how the Roadrunners respond to that challenge when they host Texas Southern in the Alamo Dome Saturday at 2.30. Texas Longhorns will kick off play in the Big 12 this weekend when they travel to a very hostile territory to face the Texas Tech Red Raiders. That's after they survived the upset mine at UTSA this past Saturday in Austin, 41-20. Now they're a five-and-a-half point favorite, even though the Longhorns are on the road in Lubbock. That's after the Horns blew out the Red Raiders last year, 70-35 to in Austin. There is no love lost between these two teams. Just ask UT basketball coach Chris Beard, who left Lubbock to move to Austin, and his first return back wasn't pretty with a reaction from Red Raider fans. And this will be Steve Sarkeesian's first ever trip to Lubbock. This is what it's about, you know. I mean, if we played 12 straight home games, I would never get to go experience what else is out there. And so uh, I'm looking forward to an awesome environment. Um, you know, Coach Beard definitely has, has reached out uh, to some degree, you know, and um, we're looking forward to it. Like I said, I mean, hey, there's a lot of places you go and the, other, the opposing fans aren't very happy we show up. Yeah, right? It is what it is. We're the University of Texas. Nobody likes us. That's okay. We embrace the hate. We'll be ready to rock and roll Saturday at 2.30. Quinn Hewers is back at practice with the Longhorns after suffering that SC sprain just nine days ago against Alabama, but no official word yet on his return. Our KSAP Pigskin Classic Award Tour continues tonight and high school volleyball next. I am very honored and proud to present to you our first annual KSAP Pigskin Classic 2022 trophy football for your victory in your first ever participation in the Alamo Dome. Thank you very much. There you go. Well, we, we appreciate that. It was a fantastic game. KSAP did an amazing job with it, and we're just happy to be a part of the first one. Yeah, that's Thank our you. visit with Judson to make sure the game ball presentation was done right. The Rockets following their 46-43 overtime victory against the Johnson Jaguars, part of the first annual KSAP Pigskin Classic in the Alamo Dome to kick off the 2022 season. High school volleyball tonight. District 27-4A undefeated Davenport hosting Canyon Lake late in the first set. The Hawks rallying Emily Pena to Haley Eckerd for a shot off the block and down. That ties the match at 19 all. Well, the Wolves respond. First, Ashton Dotson drills a spike right down the middle. Then on the set point, Talon Dotson hammers one off the block and out. Davenport takes the first set 25-20. The match three sets to none to move to 4-0 in district play. District 26-5A now. Canyon on the road against Veterans Memorial. Patriots still battling in the third set. Trinity Bishop brings the hammer down to kind of an early deficit at half. 6-3, but the Cougarettes answer with a 10-4 run. Salah New Serves up an ace. Canyon cruises to a big win. Three sets to nine. Improves 2-4-0 and in district play. District 28-6A. Clark taking on Brandeis at Northside Sports Gym. Uh, as seen on the BGC app tonight. Emma Halstead helps the Broncos start strong by serving on an ace. And the defending 6A champs take the first set 25-20. But the Cougars answer back in the second set. Tied at 24. Ariana Roberson smokes a spike right down the middle. Clark rallies to win the match three sets to one. They are now 7-0 in district play. More highlights tonight on our website, ksat.com. Looking forward to that. Just another reminder, the BGC app also has volleyball. Sure does. Yeah. Thanks, Greg. Yeah. We'll be right back. All right. Tomorrow morning, most of us in the low to mid 70s, exception, of course, hill country in the upper 60s. By the afternoon, we're well into the 90s. I mean, look at Austin, 100 degrees. Mm -hmm. Gonzales, Pleasanton, 98. Elmendorf, 97. I think around San Antonio, about 97 degrees. And a few degrees warmer, probably just shy of 100. But of course, it is within reach. We could hit or exceed the record this week. Have a great night. Good night.